ומסתו מסת גמיא, תמסו מצו תיר גמיא, מרתורמה אמרתם גמיא, אביר אביר מיידי, רודרג'ת דוקשינם מוקם, תנמם פאי נתפיאם, אום שאנטי שאנטי שאנטי. Lijas from the unreal to the real. Lijas from darkness to light. Lijas from death to immortality. Light us through and through. And guide us evermore with thy loving presence. Om. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. This morning our subject is Nibhidita, a great wonder. The prayer which, is, which I said just now was uttered by Nibhidita before her death. We are observing with Nibhidita's 150th anniversary all over the world. Last Sunday I was in Chicago. There are two big functions about Nivedita. <laughs> Nivedita appeared like a luminous comet on the horizon of India. She was really a wonder. She was very dynamic, colorful, creative, productive, impressive, attractive, and educated person. She was, origin she was an original thinker, a voracious reader, a prolific writer, magnetic speaker, and a born leader. She dedicated her life for the good of humanity. That is the reason she had many, many names. Swami Vivekananda gave her name Nibedita. Her original name was Margaret Noble. Nibedita means the dedicated one. Rabindranath Tagore called him her Lokomata, the mother of the people. Aurobindo said, Shikhamui, she was a live wire, blazing flame. Dilip Rai called her Diptimui, the luminous one. The freedom fighters called her Juan of Arc. But she was known by J.C. Bosch, the famous scientist. He called her Uma Hoimabhuti, the goddess Uma, the daughter of the snow-clad mountain Himalayas. She received a beautiful poem from her guru on her birthday, 22nd September 1900. Swamiji wrote from Brittany in France. The mother's heart, the hero's will, the sweetness of the southern breeze, the sacred charm and the strength and that dwell on Aryan's altars flaming free. All these be yours and many more. No ancient soul could dream before, be thou to India's future son, the mistress, servant, friend in one. When I think about Nibedita, a couplet of Tulasidas comes to my mind. Tulasidas said about himself, Tulsi jab jagume ayo, aye, jago hase tum roe, esi karni kar chalu ki, jag, tum hase jag roe. This great saint, 
said about himself. When you were born, you cried, and people smiled. You do, so, you do such thing in your life that when you die, you smile, that people cry for you. That we find in Sister Nivedita. She lived only 44 years, and her guru lived only 39 years. It seems the great souls do not live long. They come with a mission. When the mission is accomplished, they depart. Nivedita's name is recorded in the pages of Indian history. <coughs> History is just like a golden boat. The masses will not get a chance to enter there. Only few people can be accommodated in the pages of the history who have contributed maximum to that country, to the national heritage, and who sacrificed and dedicated herself for himself completely for that country. Only those names you will find in the pages of history. Nivedita's life is really wonders. She was the embodiment of energy, virility, strength, power, fortitude. She was strong physically, mentally, intellectually, spiritually, morally, ethically. She was <clears throat> very extremely talented person. Her pre-monastic name was Margaret Elizabeth Noble. She was born on 28 October 1867 at Janganon, Northern Ireland. Last June, 30th June, I was there. I visited her birthplace. It's a beautiful country. It is a very small town, maybe 5,000 population. We presented the complete works of Nivedita and the life to their library. And they have a hall of fame, all the great people of Ireland in their, and in their history. So Nivedita's position was seven. They put a plaque there and a message. Anyhow, it was a beautiful country. Her grandfather was a minister. Her father also was a minister. They're staunch Catholic. Her father's name was Samuel Richmond Noble, and mother's name was Isabel Hamilton. After marriage, they moved to England, Manchester, which is a small, poor town, and she was the, he was the minister, worked hard, died at the age of 34 from tuberculosis. Maybe Dita was only 10 years old. So poor mother working and took all three, two more siblings, May and Richmond. So these three kids and mother went to her father's home and they helped her. And they went to a school at Halifax, both sisters. Maybe Dita graduated in school in at the age of 17. Then at the age of 18, he took a job. she took a job to help her poor mother. You see, I love this kind of struggling soul. Do the struggle, fight against poverty to survive. You see, the Atman does not manifest from easygoing life or lying in the bed of roses. The more you hit this head of the snake, the more it raises the hood. The tree becomes strong when it is, it faces the storm, cyclone, tornado. Struggling soul. She was a voracious reader, read Shakespeare, Bible, all modern English literature. School teacher, 10 years. 
First she worked in other Keswick boarding school. Then she moved to Wimbledon and had her own school. She became a supporter of the new education movement in England, introducing Pestalozzi, Provel's method of teaching there. Then she became a member of the Sisemi Club. Some of her talented friends formed that club, where kids, then <coughs> our, our Huxley, Bernard Shaw became members. She had an attractive personality, a young woman of medium age, medium height, bright gray blue eyes, light brown, golden brown hair, a radiant complexion, and charming smile. She was serious, studious, self-willed, dominating personality. She was proud, generous, impulsive, and ardent. Moreover, she was very extremely energetic and talented that make her an instant leader. Thus, she entered the intellectual society in England. She was known during his very early age. You see, a genius, a talent cannot be hid. It manifests. You cannot hide a person like her. Then what happened? Her religious background, deeply Catholic, extremely passionate. I shall read to you a passage she, why she accepted Hinduism. It is a very interesting. I shall read it because when Swami Vivekananda passed away, she went to Bombay and gave a talk and told about her life story. Why and how and why had I adopted the Hindu religion? I can paraphrase it, but if I read it, you will get a full picture. I am a born and bred English woman until the age of 18. I was trained and educated as English girls are. Christian religious doctrines were, of course, early instilled into me. I was even from my girlhood inclined to venerate all religious teachings, and I devotedly worshipped the child Jesus and loved him with my whole heart for the self-sacrifices he always willingly underwent, while I felt I could not worship him enough for his crucifying himself to bestow <coughs> salvation on the human race. But after the age of 18, I began to harbor doubts as to the truth of Christian doctrines. Many of them began to seem to me false and incompatible with truth. These doubts grew stronger and stronger. And at the same time, my faith in Christianity tottered more and more. For seven years, I was in the wavering state of mind, very unhappy, and yet very, very eager to seek the truth. I shunned going to church, and yet sometimes my longing to bring in restfulness to my spirit impelled me to rush into church and be absorbed in the service to feel at peace within, as I had hitherto done, and as others around me were doing. But alas, no peace, no rest was there for my troubled soul, all eager to know the truth. During the seven years of wavering, it occurred to me that in the study of natural science, I should surely find the truth I was seeking. So, urgently, I began to study how this world was created and all things in it, and I discovered that in the laws of nature, at least, there was consistent consistency. But it made the doctrines of the Christian religion seem all the more inconsistent. Just then I happened to get a life of Buddha, and in it I found that here at last also was there a child who lived ever so many centuries before the child Christ, but whose sacrifices are no less self-abnegating than those of the other. This dear child, Gautama, took a strong hold on me, and for three more years I plunged myself into the study 
of the religion of Buddha. And I became more and more convinced that the salvation he preached was decidedly more consistent with the truth than the preaching of the Christian religion. I read these things for you just to get an idea how a struggle comes in the mind of a sincere soul. Struggle. I am seeking the truth. But sometimes, you know, Christian religion says Christ is the only begotten son and only salvation is possible through Christ. This, she could not take it. Salvation is not possible in any other religion. Those are very contradictory to her mind. That is the reason she was seeking, seeking, seeking something. The doctrine, dogma, all the creed could not satisfy her free, free mind. What happened? It was in October, 1895. Swami Vivekananda came to London. There was a big ad in the paper, a Hindu yogi. Hmm? And the newspaper flashed all kinds of news about Swamiji. On 15th November, Lady Isabel Marjason invited Swamiji to give a parlor talk in her house. And she was known to Nivedita. Knowing Nivedita's mind, she invited Nivedita to attend this Indian yogi's talk. And Nivedita went. First two chapters of the Master of the Swayam, you will find Swamiji in London, 1895, 1896. Very interesting, those two entries in her book. What she was looking, she was trying to find out something new which can satisfy her heart, hungry heart for God and the truth. So she heard something new from Swamiji. All our struggles is for freedom. We seek neither happiness nor misery, but freedom alone. You will find that immediately struck her on mind. Do you know why? These Irish people are trying to fight for freedom from the British. Freedom. Freedom is the song of the soul. I'm just telling you that how her mind clicked. Second, it is better to be born in a church but not to die in it. That means you grow. Third, man travels from error to truth but not from, from lower truth to higher truth, not from error to truth. She was taking notes. And at that time, Swamiji was giving a series of lectures on Gyana Yoga, both in England and in New York. Those lectures came that Swamiji's four yogas, Gyana Yoga, Karma Yoga, Bhukti Yoga, Raja Yoga. He was giving classes and lectures. And Nivedita was attended every lecture and taking notes. Swamiji stayed in London until 27 September 1895. Then again he came to New York. And then again in April he went to London and continued his lectures on Gana Yoga. And he electrified the London audience. He said, what the world wants today is 20 men and women who can dare to stand in the street yonder and say that they possess nothing but God. Who will go? Who should, why should one fear? Margaret boldly accepted the challenge. Then correspondence began. Nivedita was writing to Swamiji, and Swamiji wrote back. It was on 7 June 1896, one of the best letters of Swamiji, we find, which was written to Nivedita. Dear Miss Noble, my ideal indeed can be put into a few words, and that is to preach unto humankind the divinity and how to make it manifest in every movement of life. Who will give the world light? Sacrifice in the past has been the law. It will be, alas, for ages to come. The earth's bravest and best will have to sacrifice themselves for the good of many for the welfare of all. 
Buddhas by the hundred are necessary with eternal love and pity. Religions of the world have become lifeless mockeries. What the world wants is character. The world is in need of those whose life is one burning love, selfless. That love will make every world tell like thunderbolt. Awake, awake, great one. The world is burning with misery. Can you sleep? Let us call and call till the sleeping gods awake, till the god within answers to the call. Nimitita was very much inspired. You see, Asharja Bhakta Kushalasya Labdha, Upanishad says, the teacher should be great. And so the student also should be great. Swamiji was a great teacher. Nivedita was a great student. They respond. You see, we lecture. We talk. We need some people, those who can appreciate, can feel inspired in the end. Otherwise, teachings just it will go through one ear and you will go through the other. It must penetrate in the heart, which will change your life. That is the reason we, we find this the power of this great teacher. So, Nivedita, Swamiji told her, I have plans for women of my country, in which you, I think, would be of great help to me. Do you know what was in Swamiji's mind? Women education. As Swamiji says, a bird cannot fly with one wing. Both wings are necessary to fly. Only man cannot make this society ideal. We need women's power. And women education is heavily neglected in India. The Brahmos started, and now Swamiji started this women education. So, Swamiji was trying to borrow Nivedita from England. Nivedita also wrote, suppose he had not come to London that time, life would have been like a headless so, for I always knew that I was wishing for something. I always said that calls would come, and it did. Nivedita, Margaret, accepted Swamiji as her guru. Swamiji traveled three months in Europe, then came to India in 19, sorry, 1897, January. And Swamiji wrote to Nivedita wanted to come to India. Swamiji cautioned her. Be careful. You see, it is not easy at that time to work in India for Nivedita. Let me tell you frankly that I am now convinced that you have a great future in the work for India. What was wanted was women especially, your education, sincerity, purity, immense love, determination, and above all, the Celtic blood make you just the woman wanted. Fighting. Irish people are very fighting nature. <laughs> Yet the different difficulties are many. You must think well before you plunge in. On my part, I promise you, I will stand by you unto death, whether you work for India or not, whether you give up Vedanta or remain in it. You see, to live in England and America, and then at that time, now India has improved a lot. You will get all Western facilities in India. But at that time, it was not so easy. Very hard struggle to survive. <laughs> you will find how Nivedita struggled. So Margaret left London and arrived at Calcutta on 28th January 1898 on the SS Mombasa. Swamiji went to the port, received her, took her to a place where the English people live, on the Park Street. You see, you will have to understand, in Calcutta, middle portion for the British, the south portion, Orthodox Hindus. Hmm? Mm, north portion also, very Orthodox Hindus. At that time, Calcutta was 10 miles long, 4 miles wide, which is the capital of British India. Delhi became capital in 1912. 
Calcutta was the main place for the British. <coughs> so Swamiji arranged her. And then at the, in the meantime, Balloon Mart property was purchased. There was a small house, Miss, in February, Miss Josephine McLeod and Mrs. Olibull came to India with Swami Sharudananda. So Swami, they arranged to stay in that Balloon Mart property. Now you see Vivekananda's house where Swami lived. That is the house. And our monastery was in the Nilambar Babu's house, the other side. So Nivedita also moved in there with these two other Western women, American women. Then Tantin, Josephine McLeod asked Swamiji, how can we help you? Love India. Love India, that Swamiji said. So during that period, Swamiji used to go to have breakfast with them every morning and poured all the teachings in Nivedita's mind. <laughs> He taught India's religion and culture, history and philosophy, scriptures and spiritual tradition. Then Swamiji initiated her on 25th March 1898, Brahmacharya vows with whom a fire, and gave her name Nivedita, and blessed her, saying, Godav and follow Buddha, who was born and gave his life for others 500 times before he attained the vision of Buddha. As I said, during that time, it is not easy for the Westerner, white-skinned Christian people, to enter Hindu society. You are all malicious, untouchable, the Western people. When Swamiji was trying to come to America, a Punjit in Pondicherry told him, Kodapi na, don't cross the ocean, you will be an outcast. And now you see, all want to come to America and the West. <laughs> we are all militias now, <laughs> untouchables. How to bring Nivedita into the Hindu society? First, Swamiji was very tactful. He arranged Nivedita's lecture at the Star Theatre and invited all the elites of Calcutta. Topic, influence of the spiritual thoughts of India on England. And Nivedita mesmerized the Hindu society, first. Second, he arranged Nivedita's lecture at Kali Ghat on Kali the mother. A white woman is speaking on Mother Kali, unthinkable. <laughs> Please remember, at that time she was only 31 years old, 1898. She was born in 1867, 31 years old, young girl. Third, Nivedita, Swamiji introduced Nivedita, Holy Bull, and Miss McLeod to Holy Mother. You will have to understand, if Holy Mother accepts, the society will accept. Why? Because Sri Ramakrishna, Holy Mother, Sri Ramakrishna was the highest class of, class of Brahmin and a Paramahamsa, illumined soul. And his wife, also a high, high class of Brahmin. So she, took refreshment even with them, which is unthinkable. Swami was very happy. So that way they got entry in our society. Holy Mother asked, what is your name? My name is Miss Margaret Elizabeth Noble. Oh, my sweet child, I cannot pronounce such a big name. I shall call you Kuki. Fuki means baby girl. Yes, mother, then it was translated to her. She said, yes, mother, I am your cookie. She always used to write, your cookie. 
Even the, when the Orthodox people of Bhagavad learned that Holy Mother has accepted Nivedita as her daughter, she became part of the society. Fourth, during the a plague epidemic in Calcutta, Nivedita was involved in the relief work. She cleaned the streets, nursed the poor people in the slums. Her unselfish love and service conquered the hearts of the people. Fifth, she started a girls' school in Calcutta. You will be happy to know that building, that 17th Bospadalan, where government occupied it and gave to Ramakrishna Sharada mission. I was there last, not there, last year, September, I visited that place. It was under, under repairing and remodeling. Now, just this month, they opened it. Last month, they opened it. She started her school. And Holy Mother inaugurated that school. It was May, 1898. Very hot in Calcutta. Swamiji couldn't bear heat. So she, he went for northern India. Almora, Nainital, Kashmir, cool place. So Nivedita, Mrs. Olibul, McLeod, all went with Swamiji. During this period, Swamiji constantly trained Nivedita. You see, training is extremely important in spiritual life. Training. Swamiji taught Nivedita. Indian religion, culture, scriptures, epics, art, history, tradition. You see, and not only that, Swamiji took her to Amarnath in Kashmir, that ice lingam, that famous pilgrimage, to give her first information and so that she could, she wrote all these books, five volumes of Nivedita and two volumes of Nivedita's letters, nearly thousand letters. Huge literature. That is her legacy. Swamiji was pouring and pouring, and that thing came, she received, she received all these ideas of Swamiji, and then she expressed. That is the way it goes. <laughs> then, in June 1899, Swamiji again came to the West, first England, then in America. At that time, most of the time, he worked in the West, West Coast of USA, California. What Nivedita needed? Money. Who will give money for her education? <coughs> was in girls' education in Calcutta. She was not successful at all. In Chicago, she, uh, she appealed, if all women give one dollar a month, that will be enough for me. She got only five dollars. <laughs> she went to Michigan. Now, then she, there I some, through me, somebody's influence, she got $500. And then I think Mr. Swami, one of the Swamiji's devotees, gave $6,000. And she was so depressed time to time, Swamiji was encouraged her. Why are you so much depressed? If mother wants to work through you, she will bring money. If mother does not want to work through you, Fine, you will go and rest. <laughs> Always depend upon God, not on your ego. Surrender ego to God. God will work through you. It is hard for Nivedita to accept that, but she did. <laughs> Nivedita, then Swamiji returned to India again. December 1900, and Nivedita also came back in February 1902 from the West. She, most of the time, she stayed in England, America and England. Swamiji died on 4th of July 1902. Nivedita rushed to Belurmot. She was very much shocked. She wrote her, in her diary, Swami died. 
In London on 13 December 1896, Swamiji had said in his farewell address, it may be that I shall find it good to get outside my body, to cast it off like a worn out garment. But I shall not cease to work. I shall inspire men everywhere until the world shall know that it is one with God. So those words rang in Nivedita's ears. She wrote, Swamiji is not dead. She is always with us. I cannot even grieve. I only want to work. There is a great, great saying of Major Link, if you have been greatly influenced by anyone, prove it in your life and not by your tears. Nebhita did not spend any time for grieving and crying for the Guru. What did she do? My now duty is to awake this nation. She left Calcutta, went to Baroda, met Aurobindo, who was the librarian there of the then Bombay, Madras, Patna, Lucknow, all big cities Nibidita went for tour and lecture, lecture about Swamiji's ideas, how to awake this great nation. In that connection, she met all the national leaders, Aurobindo, Gokhale, Tilak, Lala Lajpatrai, Gandhi, Bipin Pal, Shurendranath Banerjee, in inspiring the young freedom preachers. As a result, she officially disconnected herself from the Ramakrishna mission because it is the policy, it, because its policy is to be free from politics. Nevertheless, she always signed her name, Nivedita of Ramakrishna Vivekananda. Swami Brahman, that to do it, otherwise, <coughs> Ramakrishna mission has no connection with politics. And Nivedita entered the politics and this freedom movement, there will be a repercussion on the, of the of Swamiji's order. Swamiji emphatically said that. So Nivedita obeyed it. Nivedita and Aurobindo planned the future course of the freedom movement in India. She regularly lectured on the Dawn Society. When will arise then the veritable fighter in the good cause again, with the Gita in the one hand and the sword in the other? The government put surveillance on her activities, but did not arrest her. Aurobind was arrested, but they, later she was he was released by Siyar Das, Chitranjan Das. He defended in the court. Let me tell you one thing, the British judge. Is it a crime to love your own country? Tell me first. You English people, you love your country, don't you? Is it a crime? So this person loves his country. How can we think that it is a crime? Yes. That is the way. We, love, we want to love our motherland. Swamiji's brother also was arrested. He was also a freedom fighter, and he was the editor of the Jugantar magazine. 10,000 rupees bail needed that to raise that money. And he released Swamiji's brother, and secretly sent him to America. Well, if you stay in British India, again you will be arrested. And again, he sent, she sent Aurobind also. to Pondicherry, via Chandranagar. You see, India was under three foreign rulers, British, French, and Portuguese. French, Chandranagar, Pondicherry, there's a French colonies, Goa, Damon, Diu, they are the Portuguese colonies. We know this, how India was divided. So from Chandranagar, that the British people cannot challenge there because it is French colony. So thus, he went to Pondicherry. I have a letter. Miss McLeod was writing Rabindranath Tagore, 
Swamiji's brother is in the country, could you find a job for him <laughs> in India? Being endowed with God-given talent, unlimited energy, and the blessings of our Guru, Nibhidhira became a source of inspiration to Indians in various important fields. <coughs> the Indian people worshipped her, adored her, and the British people hated her, thinking that she was a traitor. <coughs> Nibhidhira used to repeat, Bharat, Bharat, Ma, Ma, Bande, Mataram. She helped the scientist Jagadish Bose in his research by collecting money and editing his books. She inspired historians such as Yodunath Sarkar and Radha Kumud Mukherjee and helped the economist Bina Sarkar to write the social history of India. She edited the history of Bengali literature written by Dinesh Shen. She regularly contributed articles and art reviews to the modern review magazine which was edited by Ramananda Chatterjee. She appreciated the masterpieces of Indian paintings produced by Ovandana Tagore, such as Bharat Mata. She sent Nandalal Bosch, Ashit Haldar, and other modern artists to Ajanta Ilora to copy the frescoes in those caves to recover the spiritual heritage of India. She herself traveled to Ajanta, Ilora, Agra, Delhi, Varanasi, Gaya, Nalanda, Chitor, Jaipur, Udaipur, Udaigiri, Khanjagiri, and other places of India to study the beauty of Indian art and write articles on it. What a point! Sometimes when I read her life, do you know what I feel? What a speed this woman had! Speed! Our speech is the bullock cart speed. <laughs> it does not go two miles an hour. Two, three miles. And <laughs> Nibhidhi is a tremendous speed. That really overwhelms me. Among 44 years in her life, do you know how many years Nibhidhi is stayed in India? Only nine years. And what she did. I just gave a little preview to you. It is very little I told you. That behind all these great people and their success was Nivedita. Nivedita was a wonderful art critic. One artist made an image, made a painting of Buddha. Swami Nivedita said, my goodness, you made the Buddha, he a Chinese Buddha, a little flat nose, you know. <laughs> Buddha was an Indian priest. Prince, he was not born with a flat nose. You are imitating Chinese and Japanese style of art. <laughs> Regarding beauty, the Indian forms are not less than Romans and the Greeks. She was very proud that she is an Indian, she is a Hindu. My goodness. She is more Hindu than all of us, I tell you frankly. <laughs> then she, Nandalal Bosch made some paintings and showed her first Kali. These people are the, the art school in, of Calcutta. Known, fam, very famous. He was the head in the Shanti Nikatan, Nandalal Bosch. Seeing that portrait of Kali, Nivedita commented, is this Kali? She should be naked with no covering. You put a lot of clothes on her body. <laughs> Read Swamiji's writings about Kali to understand how she should be depicted. Then she saw a painting that Dasharath fainted and Kaushala was fanning her husband. Because when Rama was banished to the forest, that painting he, she made. My goodness, what did you do? You put a palm leaf fan in the hand of a queen. It should be an ivory fan. You have never seen ivory fan. Go to the museum and see what, how it looks. She was a fantastic art critic. I made a, Nandala wrote, I made a painting of Swami Vivekananda. When she saw it, she commented, this picture is not right. You have covered Swamiji's body with too many clothes. He never covered himself in that manner. Moreover, the climate is not suitable for that many coverings. 
look at the image of Buddha. Is his body covered? Swamiji was like Buddha. Nibhidita was under the wings of Holy Mother. Every evening she used to go after school to Mother, clean her room, dust her windows, meditated with her, ate with her, which is unthinkable for the Orthodox people. My daughter, Bas. I shall tell you a funny story. Nivedita wanted to put on shari. So perhaps you have seen how Indian women put on shari. So in the corner, the, the upper part they put on their shoulder. In the corner of the shoulder, on the, um, of the cloth, they, buy, they tie a bunch of key. That means the women think that I am in power, you see. <laughs> Where there is key, there is the power. Now our new women have their bags and, you know, cell, cell phone and the bags. They do not have a bunch of key in their shari. <laughs> so what happened, the shari was falling again and again from her shoulder. So Holy Mother smiled. And do you know what a remark she made? A meter bhitro shada, bairo shada. This girl is inside is white and outside is white. And it was curious, what did you say, mother? Well, this is not my word, Sri Ramakrishna said it. When? Well, most probably it was in car festival, and she mentioned the time. I guess it was in 1884. Holy Mother said, I was carrying the foot tray for the master, and he was in Samadhi on his bed. And after that, she came, he came back and said, I went to a country far, far away. There, the people are white complexion. And mm, they are also devotees of the Lord, mother. So Nibhidhi was curious, mother. So she went to a devotee's house, Shoshi Bhushan Ghosh, Sri Ramakrishna's householder devotee. I said, could you find, locate that date from the Almanac? 1884, car festival. So they opened the almanac and found the date. Then she came back to her school and compared in her diary, it was there that that day she had a dream and saw Sri Ramakrishna on the same date. It was in 1884. Very interesting story. Holy Mother's major remark, even Norrin's daughter, so the master appeared before you. Nivedita. It was not, she was, you see, nobody wants to give the girl to Nivedita. Do you know why? Because if my daughter becomes a Christian, nobody will marry her. They are very hesitant. So Nivedita had to struggle to get girls from the two local people. She would go door to door. I have a horse carriage. I shall pick up your girls and I shall return to, the, to your home. Please give your daughters. Some people bang door in front of her. Some people say, all right, get in. When they got out, get out. when she was out, they sprinkle Ganges water to purify that place. <laughs> How she was tormented. Oof. Unbelievable. Holy Mother was in tears. These girls, for the, her guru's sake and for the education of our girls, sacrificed her life and how she was treated. Then she went to Dokshinishwar to see Kali Temple. So one of her students wrote, It was painful to observe that Nivedita could not see the image of Kali in Dokshinishwar because she was a Christian and a Westerner. She would stand in the courtyard and try to visualize the mother. Alas, how many Hindus are so as devoted to Kali as Nivedita was? Psh. What did she do? Hot. Calcutta weather is hot and humid in summer. Nivedita used to say, Mathai bodo kosto. There is pain in my head. 
no electricity, kerosene lantern, writing books day and night so that she can earn money for the girls' education in India. With a palm leaf fan, she was fanning herself. You know, I love to see this struggle. These people only shine. Their Atman awakens, Atma Shakti awakens. Nivedita taught Indian history twice a week. And her method of teaching was something unique. Just the students are there, she will penetrate in their minds through her talk and through imagery. Listen, she was teaching the history of Rajasthan, the, the Rajputs. I climbed to the top of the hill, knelt down on a rock, closed my eyes, and began to think of Queen Podmini. At that, she sat down, closed her eyes, and folded her hands. Her facial expression beggar description. Nivedita continued, Devi Podmini was standing with folded hands, facing the blazing fire. I was trying to imagine Podmini's last thought before she jumped into the fire to avoid surrendering to the Muslim king, Alauddin Khilji. Alauddin Khilji invaded Chitor and wanted to get Podmini. And Podmini jumped into the fire and saved her chastity. With that, Nivedita remained in silence. A Muslim king, how wonderful was her chastity. It was wonderful, it was beautiful. With that, Nivedita remained in silence with closed eyes in front of her students and the class was over. That is the way one should teach history, how to penetrate these images and the incisions and the ideas and the thoughts in the minds of the students. Nivedita loved for and faith in Ramakrishna, Holy Mother, Swamiji are phenomenal. She would talk about her guru to her students. My guru was Vireshwar. He was a god for heroes. The heroes of the world must follow in his footsteps. You all must be heroes and overcome this little happiness and misery of the world. In the girls' classroom, there, were, there was a world map on one on one wall and a picture of Ramakrishna on the other wall. Nibhidhita took the world, pop, world map, put it below Ramakrishna's picture and said, Ramakrishna was a teacher of the world, so the world map should be below his feet. Amazing, Nivedita. One of our students wrote about the school condition. The class took place on the floor. We sat on a mat, and there was a low desk in front. Sister told the student to always to sit erect. One sister took us to the museum. She had brought a big package of dried fruits. And after visiting the museum, he asked, she asked one of the girls to distribute the fruits to, to all the girls. So she distributed, and she distributed to Nivedita also. Then asked, let me see how much is left. Nothing. She gave everything to others. Nivedita remarked with a sweet smile, this is natural for the girls in this country. They are always busy serving others without keeping anything for themselves. That she liked. If you really want to be great in your life, sacrifice. Only sacrifice can make a person great. Others, people, ordinary people, they are born like corn and die like corn, like mushrooms. Nobody keeps track for those people. Swamiji says, when you are born, leave a mark in this world that you came. And Nibhidita left that mark. You know, if you want to see greatness of a person, see the small things, not the big things. On the stage, you know, I'm a big lecturer and this and that. No, no, no. 
go and check his personal life. I shall tell you one incident Ramananda Chacharji wrote. Once I went to see her at Damdam. He was a very famous person. He was the editor of Prabhashi and Nawajan Review magazine. At the residence of Jogadish Bose, I had an early lunch and reached there at their last time. As soon as she heard, Nivedita heard my arrival, she came out and asked someone to feed the driver first. She told the driver to feed the horses and to give them rest. Then she offered tea to me and we had a long conversation about the publication work. I was moved by her compassion for the horses. Another time I was passing through Shukhiya Street in North Calcutta. We noticed Nivedita in another carriage. She saw a puppy dog gasping on the footpath. She immediately stopped the carriage, bought some milk from a shop, and fed the dog to save its life. You know, these little, little incidents prove the greatness of her heart. Nivedita was glorified by poets, scientists, artists, writers, national leaders, journalists, and many Indian and foreign savants. I, cannot, I told in brief some of the things I mentioned, that how the contemporaries looked at Nivedita. We are amazed when we see the Taj Mahal in India, the pyramids in Egypt and the Great Wall in China. We wonder how it is possible to build all these great things. Similarly, we are in wonder as we witness the legacy of Nivedita in various fields of Indian national life. She lived and worked in India for approximately nine years among the 44 years of her lifetime. Nivedita is no more with us, but her powerful writings made her immortal. Apart from her voluminous writings and letters, the Master of the Swayam, the wave of Indian life, the credentials of Hinduism, her masterpieces. There are many biographies about Nivedita. She worked in the fields of religion, politics, nationalism, art, literature, science, education, journalism, and more. She was a genius with an encyclopedic knowledge. Nivedita became the moving figure in the Renaissance of India. Then, sometimes summer she used to go to Darjeeling, which is a little cool place. Mm -hmm. Last year, in September, three days, I stayed in the room next to Nivedita's room. That house now belongs to the Ramakrishna order. Her room is now a shrine. And from her room, you can see Kanchenjunga. This side, the other hill, Tiger Hill, you can see the Mount Everest. But this side, you can see Kanchenjunga. And when the sunrise comes, you can see how it glitters on the, that snow peaks. Beautiful, really beautiful. I also saw. I opened my window, and I can see the sunrise early in the morning during my meditation. On 13th October 1911, Nivedita passed away from the century. And I, they built a monument where her body was cremated, and the, and the statue also. And it is mentioned here reposes Sister Nivedita, who gave her all to India. Abhala Boshu, Jagadish Boshu's wife, was present. During her last moment, she prayed, O Lord, lead us from the unreal to the real, darkness to light, and death to immortality. Finally, her face became luminous, and she uttered, The boat is sinking, but I shall see the sunrise. Thus, Nivedita merged into light divine. Nivedita's ashes was brought by Brahmachari gone into Belurmat. It was put in a casket and kept in Swami Vivekananda's shrine. On the eastern wall, there is a niche. Nivedita's ashes are there. Every day, the priest will put flowers on Nivedita's casket. When Nivedita died, Holy Mother cried. Do you know what she said? 
जेहाय महाप्राणी जेहाय शुभ प्राणी ताजुन्य कांदे महाप्राणी ऑल पीपल क्राइ फॉर ग्रेट सोल निविदिता वन सेड टू मी मदर वी आर हिंदूज इन आवर प्रीवियस बर्थ्स वी आर बोर्न इन द वेस्ट सो दैट द मास्टर्स मैसेज मे स्प्रेड देयर Nivedita left a mark on this earth and justified her name, Nivedita, the JJKJ one. Thank you. Um, sahana babatu, sahana bhunaktu, sah birjam karva vai, tejasvi na vadhi tamas tu ma bedve shabhoi. Om shanti 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 him. May Brahman protect us. May He guide us. May He give us strength and raise understanding. May love and harmony be with us all. Om, peace, 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 and hope.